So today we're in the second week in our series, and um, it's called Woke Yet. Now, as I told you last week, we're taking back the term, uh, reclaiming it from where you may think the term exists or lies in social media and on the news. We're talking about spiritual awakening. Are you woke yet? Have you begun to grow in your walk with the Lord? Is your spirit changing? Are you becoming more like Jesus? Last week, we talked about Romans 12, one and two, and we said, don't be conformed to the image of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Then you'll know, you'll understand what God's good, pleasing and perfect will really is. And so that was our kickoff. And then I told you for the next five weeks, we'll be talking about a practical tip or strategy, something to implement in your life so that you will begin to grow and become more like Jesus. And today is going to be one of the most um, difficult for me to apply for you um, and um, probably the easiest for you to identify in your own life, but it's going to be the biggest challenge for you to do something about. And I'm going to tell you right now, your tendency is going to be the same as my tendency. And that is that you're going to hear these things that I'm talking about and they will string or strike a chord of truth in your heart and you may nod your head a little bit, but you're going to be tempted to walk away and do nothing different. And really, this is the beginning of um, not just the series, but it's the core principle, the foundational principle for everything that's going to build from here until Easter when we conclude. And today we're going to be talking about two things that you have to identify in your life, two things that you are going to have to decide um, what your life is going to look like as you adjust and course correct. And so it's going to be tough for you. I can't just give you three simple steps that work for everyone. I'll give you principles and then trust that you're going to go and take these and allow God to do something amazing in you. Today, we're going to be talking about slowing down and talking about celebrating moments in life that are worth celebrating. Way too much of life happens in a hurry where we are running from something or running to something, waiting in line, waiting to live. And when we are always in a hurry with no margin in our lives, we miss the beauty. We miss the celebration. And God is a God of beauty and of celebration. He is a God who tells us to stop and smell the roses. A God who delights in things as mundane as the sun rising and setting each day or as a bird deciding to migrate north or come back south when the weather warms a little bit, who delights in a child as they take their first steps and as an adult who takes their last breath, a God who is fully immersed in the day-to-day -day of our lives and celebrates. So we're gonna talk about a Psalm, a great Psalm, Psalm 118. It's the last Psalm in a book or a group of Psalms that were written to say thank you, to praise God. And these Psalms were written for different reasons or purposes, but all around the theme of saying God is a great God and he's worthy of celebrating. In Psalm 118, we see a really powerful Psalm. That's one you may know, you might've memorized. And if you haven't, I encourage you to memorize it because this is a life changing Psalm. And I'm gonna tell it to you real quick. And when you read it, you're going to be tempted to go, yep, yep, that's true. But we're going to just dive in today. We're not going to oversimplify, but we're going to take our time and spread this thing out, let it breathe, and to see what God may say as we examine his word. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Do you want to read that with me? Let's do that together. This is the day the Lord has made we will rejoice and be glad in it. So I'm going to break it down. This is the day. This is the day. Today is the day. Today is the day where you find the moment now. Now is the only time you can respond to God. Now is the only time you can respond in obedience. Now is the only time you can celebrate. This moment right now is the only moment that you're guaranteed in life. Our next moment may not come. The moment we've lived yesterday and earlier today is already gone. This is the day. This is the moment. This is the day that the Lord has made. A lot of life is spent running. A lot of life is spent busy. You can't live life in a hurry and embrace and enjoy the reality of the day. You can't love in a hurry. You can't listen to someone in a hurry. You can't celebrate small moments in a hurry. Yet we hurry. So we're going to talk at first on just how to, to settle down, to settle in 
and to embrace the day. And really the first simple principle that I want to give you is as we, as we look at the fact that this is the day that God has made, we have to, to agree not to look back. Because you may agree with me that when you constantly look over your shoulder or in the rear view mirror about how great things used to be in the past or how bad things used to be in the past, it defines you and can paralyze you from moving forward into this moment. Does that make sense? We all on the same page? I want us to be on the same page now because we got a little distance to cover. And if we're not on the same page now, then we'll be more distant as we go and not more together. So let me say it again. When we're constantly looking at yesterday, we can never fully be present today. So we have to come to terms with yesterday, which sometimes involves forgiveness. We put a period at the end of the sentence and choose to move forward. When we look at yesterday and talk about how great it was and couldn't we go back or wouldn't we go back or shouldn't we go back? We have to put a period at the end of that sentence and say we can never go back. And sometimes worshiping the past or being stuck or preoccupied in the past, this is an important thing, important statement, but sometimes being preoccupied with the past is a way to mask discontent in the present, disappointment with God on the way he treated you in the past or the way he's treating you in the present because it's not as good as your past. So we have to agree for this to be the day to stop being preoccupied with the way things were, good or bad, and move beyond. We're people who look forward. We learn from the past but we live today. The second thing you have to agree with, or I hope you'll agree with, is that we can't constantly be forward looking. We can't always be looking at what's next because when we're always looking at what's next, we can never be present in this moment. Do you know anybody like that? Are you somebody like that? You think you're gonna be happy. You think you're gonna find joy. You think you're gonna find meaning. You think things are gonna get better or less complicated. And there's always an event that you're waiting for, a set of circumstances when you're in high school. When I graduate, things are gonna get better. They'll be more simple. I'll be happy. You graduate and you find out you're the same person you were when you were in high school. And then you get to college and you're like, well, when I graduate from college, things will be different. Things will be better. I'll be happy. When I get a boyfriend, things will be better. I'll be happy. When I get a girlfriend, things will be better. I'll be happy. When I get a degree, things will be better. I'll be happy. I'll settle down. When I get my first job, things will be better. Things will slow down. I'll be happy. When I have my first child, things will be better. I'll be happy. I'll slow down. When my kids leave home, I'll be happy. Things will be better. It'll slow down. When I retire, you follow the pattern. And we live with the God of our life, not being the Lord Jesus Christ, but the word when. And our comfort and our ability to settle and our ability to be in and fully present now is always determined by a set of circumstances that have not yet happened and may never will happen. And we have to offer the word when, W-H-E-N, to the Lord and say, when is about you. It's not about me. And it's easy for us to offer God the things that we can not control, but really hard to give God those things we can. And for some reason, we think we can control our future. We think what happens next is up to us. Well, some of us say, I can't really be in this present moment because there's not much to celebrate and I don't have much joy. And that's when we have to look at the reality of who God is and the blessings that God has given us. And we're gonna do that in the second half of our time together. But let's just move forward to the next little part of this phrase. Are you ready? This is the day, the day now, not yesterday, not tomorrow. This is the day that the Lord has made and the Lord has made it good. Do you feel that it's good? Is today a good day? I will rejoice and be glad in it. How? Because this is the day that the Lord has made. Three parts, three very simple parts. I am the me that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in me. Can you say that? And not about me, but about you. I am the me that the Lord has made. I have shortcomings. There are things I wish were different. 
things that I might change if I were God. But I'm the me that the Lord has made. And he's made me on purpose. Intentionally. Which means that you, that I, am necessary. And we have a tendency of focusing on all the things we don't like about ourselves and wish we're different. And to be able to say, thank you, God, for making me me. Because even though if I were you, I might have done things a little differently. Like I might have been a little taller like Pastor Dan. I don't know. I don't know that life's easier up there or not. Sometimes it seems easier. He hits his head on things and stuff. So maybe it's not as easy. He doesn't fit in airplanes well. There's always something, right? Thank you, God, for making me me. Because you meant to make me. And even if it seems like a mess, remember last week and how we closed, you're doing something. A masterpiece in progress. And I'm not the me I'm going to be. Now, the second thing we have to do is we unpack this. This is the day the Lord has made. If God has made it, then that means not only is this the day and I'm the me, but they are the they that the Lord has made. It's so easy for us to blame other people for our happiness or unhappiness. And it may be your husband or wife. It may be your kids. It may be your mom or dad, your brother or sister, a coworker, a boss, employees, but they are the people who God has allowed in your life. And they are the they that the Lord has made. Now, some of you may need to remove some people from your life who are unhealthy. You wanna know who you're going to be like? Look at the five people you spend most of your time around. That's just the way it is. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the group that you find yourself with or around. Most of the time, the one assigned to you, not the one that you've chosen. And it's so easy for us to blame and to enable ourselves and to excuse. And the reality is that we can't control other people and we can't control their behavior and they are the they that the Lord has made. Perfect, no. Made by God, yes. So this is the way I want you to frame it. And this is a subtle turn of phrase, but really important. Are you ready? I want you to frame it like this. God did not put them in my life. Whoever it is, you're they. You tracking with me? You got your they in your mind? Are you here today with your they? No, I'm I'm just kidding. If you're here today with your they, don't, don't share, especially to them. It doesn't work well. You got your they in your mind, right? God did not put them in your life as much as he put you in their life. And do you see how that subtle shift of perspective totally changes the way that we relate to the people who are around us? That yes, God allowed them to be a part of your life, but God chose for you to be a part of theirs. So what are you doing about it? I am the me the Lord has made. They are the they the Lord has made. The third and final one is it is the it that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. But what if the it's not very good? We've had good circumstances. We've had bad circumstances. Sometimes we're happy, sometimes we're sad, sometimes we're rich, sometimes we're broke, sometimes we're obedient, sometimes we blow it. It is the it the Lord has made. If God has not put me or caused the circumstances in my life, he's allowed them. And my Bible tells me that all things work together for good as God is working them together for good. For those who love him, and have chosen to follow him as their savior and Lord. Which doesn't mean all things are good. God works good things and bad things together for good. And not the kind of good that's external, but the intrinsic spiritual good that comes from the fruit of the spirit, peace, love, joy, hope, these things being developed and grown in us. And it is the it that God has made 
And sometimes it stinks and sometimes it's wonderful, but it is what it is. And that's not important because God is who he is. But this first little part of this psalm, this short section of scripture that was written really to celebrate the exodus from Egypt, where when the Jews would have recited this or sung this or heard it, they would have remembered God's deliverance. They would have remembered a point in time where things seemed bleak, where God showed up, where even though the people in their lives weren't really people, they were captors who they wanted around. They were people who were being killed, eradicated, genocide. They didn't have a future. They were miserable and in slavery. But yet there was a day, a day like any other day that changed everything. It was the day the Lord had made. And then they had to choose what they were gonna do about it. Now there's another person in scripture I wanna take you to real quickly. And this is a guy who found himself, and I love to share this illustration with you because it's just, it grounds me in reality. He's a guy who found himself in a bad place, a dark place. You ever found yourself in a dark place? I don't want you to necessarily raise your hand because my next question is even darker. You ever found yourself in a place where you're just not sure you want to be around? Where you're just not 100% sure you want to keep going? Where you and your dark thoughts, I'm not saying that you have a plan, but I'm saying that in your dark thoughts, maybe you wonder. Well, this is a guy who was used by God in some amazing ways. And he went through a lot in his life. A lot that wasn't his fault. And then a lot that was his fault. And he was tired. And he was frustrated. And he was disillusioned. And after this amazing power encounter or power struggle, with some false gods and some supernatural intervention. He was afraid for his life and he ran. He was running because of what happened in the past and not just the circumstances, but, but God and his interaction and his confidence in God and what he was worried about and what he thought and he ran. He was running because he didn't even think there was gonna be a future for him. And if there was, it wasn't one he wanted to be part of. And he was exhausted and he threw himself down by a brook. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush and he sat down under it and he prayed that he might die. And then he said these things. Have you ever thought these things? I've had enough, Lord. You ever said that? I have had enough, Lord. I've had enough. I'm just a person. This can't possibly be the day you've made. These can't possibly be the people who you intend for me to be with. I can't be the person you had in mind. I have had enough, Lord. And then he said, I'm not better than anybody else. I'm, my ancestors are dead. My friends are dead. My parents are dead. I just want to die. Take my life from me right now, God. Take it. He'd lost his perspective. He'd lost his focus. He'd lost his joy. Life had become so hurried. He'd become a runner. He had no energy. He had no margin. And he did probably the most spiritual thing that he could do at the time, which was to lay down and go to sleep. And the next section in scripture, as you'll see in a minute, was that God intervened. But a lot of embracing the day and finding the joy is slowing down and looking in the first place. I don't know how many of you have been looking around the church this morning, but there have been some things that, uh, well, um, I'll just show you, see if you can see this. Has anyone seen um, today a, a little Jesus anywhere in the church? Okay. Um, I asked somebody what the plural of Jesus was. Was it Jesus? And that wasn't it, right? That sounds like a rapper that's performing at the Super Bowl. Um, uh, no, Jesus is. There, there's some Jesuses here. And this is, this is what, why they're out there. I didn't do it, okay? I love the idea. Didn't think I liked it at first, but really love the idea. Now, um, our youth group 
and one of our small group um, leaders, of our ladies leaders, the high school girls, they decided that they were going to put um, some of these Jesus around the church. And, and so the leader, the youth leader, Robin Sanger, she came to me in the staff office and, and I didn't know context. And she goes, hey, Pastor Rick, do you like Jesus? And um, I'm like, well, I said, yeah, I, I like Jesus. I'm a fan. She goes, good, because I bought several hundred of Jesus and, and we're putting them around the church. Now, she didn't ask if you bought several hundred Jesus and put, put around the church. I mean, it was just, do you like Jesus? Of course I do. And I said, well, why do you want to do this? Why do your girls want to do this? And it was really a simple answer. And I, the more I thought about it, the more I liked it. She said, I feel like that people in our church need a little Jesus in their life. Now, don't get all hung up on the graven image thing and you can't make it Jesus, that's sacrilegious. I mean, we're, we're way beyond that in our adult Christian lives. But I love what it represents. It represents a couple things. One, we all do need a little Jesus in our life. Number two, we don't see Jesus oftentimes, unless we look. When we found out that there were little Jesuses around the church, that they'd hidden them on Wednesday night, the staff, we took off looking for them. And my wife took off across the cafe to go find a little Jesus and walk past six of them <laughs> because she was trying to find one. But you know why? Because she was in a hurry. And then I have a friend who was in our service earlier and toward the end of the time before he went down to his city group, he came up to me and he said, 24. And I said, what are you talking about, 24? I didn't have any idea. He said, I found 24 Jesuses. He said, I walked around looking for Jesus and I found Jesus everywhere. And I thought, isn't that exactly what we're supposed to do? To slow down, to breathe, to put the past back here to trust God without here, to be in the moment. This is the day. Now is the now. I am the me. They are the they. It is the it. I'm going to look for Jesus. And friends, when you look for Jesus, you find your joy. So I don't know if I've told you already today or not, but I was just thinking this as we were singing. I'm really glad you're here. And I'm really glad you tuned in online if that's what you've chosen to do. And you may be here on purpose. You may be here because you want to be here. You might be here because somebody, you know, promised to take you out afterwards or, you know, they would root for your, the Chiefs or the 49ers on the Super Bowl or, or um, you know, maybe your parents made you come. I don't know. But I'm grateful you're here. And I want more than anything else for you to hear this message from the Lord um, and for me not to get in the way. And in a message like this, this one's a really hard one because I think it's so important and I'm being 100% transparent with you as I try to be, I'm really bad at it. Um, spiritual authenticity is, is, is an important quality for all of us, but particularly for a preacher. And I think many times preachers have a tendency not to be super authentic. And, and if I were you, I would wanna know two things. I would wanna know, first of all, is what he's saying true. And the second thing is I would wanna know, does he believe what he's saying is true. That's what I would want to know if I were you, because truth is most important. And then does the messenger, does the person who's standing up there really believe it? And I can tell you, I wholeheartedly believe that this is true, but it doesn't mean that it's easy for me. Now, I might be better at it than you are, but I'm not comparing myself to you. I may not be better at it than you. I'm sure I'm not, but I don't compare myself to you because that's me being better or you being better than me. I compare myself to Jesus and say, where is the standard and how can we grow together? Because I believe with my whole heart that this is true and it's so important, but it doesn't mean that I experience it in any different way than you, than you do. In fact, this slowing down and seeing beauty in life is probably one of my biggest challenges because um, I'm wired in a way that just doesn't live that way. It's personality. Um, you know, part of, as some of you know, my thyroid condition, being treated for thyroid cancer, they've got my thyroid levels turned up so high that even if I wanted to slow down, sometimes it, feel like, it feels like that's still Mach 1. And so I really have to work on it. Yesterday, Joy and I took off, we were driving downtown. And I asked her this question after we got downtown. I said, is it just when I come out to drive that all the idiots decide to get behind the wheel? Everybody was in my way. And I'm like, God is doing this to test me. And Joy just kind of looked at me and, and, and she was like, what are you preaching on tomorrow? Now, 
she knew, she knew what I was preaching on today, but she just said it and just kind of smiled. And, and then a minute later, I think I heard her say, good luck. I'm not hundred percent sure <laughs> I heard that. Is that what she said? Yeah. Um, because it's just, it's difficult for us. And there's a difference between hurry and busy. I use the words interchangeably to this point. Um, we need to have things to do in our lives. Jesus was busy, but he was never in a hurry. You can't love in a hurry. You cannot get to know somebody in a hurry. You can't spot beauty in a hurry, but you can still be effective with your time. The Bible tells us, as we discussed last week at the very end of our time together, that we are God's masterpiece in progress, his poema, created in Christ Jesus to do the works that God has prepared for us in advance. My point here is that if you are in such a hurry that your life has no margin, where you're running from one thing to the next, where you get to the end of the day and you have no energy left to connect with your kids, to connect with your spouse. If all you wanna do is sit and turn on Netflix or stare at your phone. If you find that you're never comfortable in this present moment, you tell yourself that you have no choice because life has forced you to be this way. If you have to be in such a hurry to accomplish the things that you feel like you need to accomplish, and this is really important, I want you to listen, please. If you feel like that you have to be in such a hurry that you have to sacrifice the beauty in life, the relationships in life, the love that you're supposed to give and receive in life, if you feel that hurry is causing you to, to do this because you have to accomplish certain things and have to get certain things done, then you want to accomplish the wrong things. And the things that you want to get done are your things, they're not God's. Because the Bible says that God has ordained, chosen work for you to do that's part of his plan in turning you into his masterpiece and that as you are effective, busy, you will never be in a hurry because when you're in a hurry, you miss the beauty. And this is a hard one. I mean, it's a hard one. The world tells us we're supposed to be in a hurry. Our accomplishments are what we're known for, the legacy we leave behind. And you know, when we're so busy trying to leave a legacy behind or a reputation that God hasn't asked us to leave in the first place, I'm the one trying to create not God. I'm the one making the choices, not God. I'm the one calling the shots, not God. How much achievement does God want for me to have? How much money does he want for me to have? How many promotions does he want for me to have? How much success in life does he want for me to have? And it may be a lot, but if he's chosen that for you, he's going to allow the way for you to do that and not be in a hurry because the hurry sickness is not just a sickness of your calendar, it's a sickness in our heart. And it shows that everything else is out of perspective and out of line. We have to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our lives, but yet still stay, stay somewhat busy. And you may say impossible, but I say possible because after all, we are being transformed. We're not conforming to the schedule of the world. We're being transformed by the renewing of our minds. All right, back to Elijah. He finds himself asleep, goes up to a cave. My perspective, my thoughts is that he sits there with his arms folded, throwing a temper tantrum, saying, all right, God, I told you I wanna die. What are you gonna do? And um, God says, hey, go up to the cave. I'll meet with you and we'll go from there. So what would you do if you were having a meeting with God? You know, you'd probably put on decent clothes, you know, not, maybe not a suit and tie, but you know, you'd clean up a little bit, right? Smooth the hair down. I don't know what you'd do, right? You know, you're gonna have a meeting with God. He goes up to the mountaintop, goes up to the cave, waiting to hear from God. Probably sulking just a little bit. So we see that the Lord said, when you're standing out on the mountain, wait for God's presence. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart, shattered the rocks. Can you imagine? Tearing the mountains and shattering the rocks. And a wind 
that's so loud causes everybody to stop. Do you remember where you were in the Doratio? The De Jericho, you know what I'm talking about? Four years ago, whenever it was. I remember where I was. I was in the gym, Legacy Fitness, second floor, glass walls, floor to ceiling. I'm like, hey, it's getting a little stormy out here. And I was in the middle of working out, I'm busy. And I'm looking out and I'm like, man, it's getting a lot stormy out here. And I go and I stood in the corner of the gym where there was two glass walls and you know, like a Titanic moment. And I see a porta, I see a porta potty from a construction site in the air, like a missile down. And I'm like, I probably should move. I mean, it got my attention. You want to speak to me right now? I'm listening. Nothing was more important than dodging the porta potty and getting away from the glass windows. God wasn't in the wind. We don't have to slow down to hear God in the wind. And God's not in the business of yelling and chasing us. That's marriage, right? One partner in one room, one in the other saying, what'd you say? Right? I mean, you don't know. You're busy doing other stuff. That's not how God works. After the wind, there was an earthquake. You ever been in an earthquake? I have. I used to live in California until God delivered me from there. And I remember my first earthquake. I was sitting at an outdoor cafe having a burrito reading a newspaper, a literal newspaper. I don't know why it was there and I was reading it. Underneath an overhang, a porch. And all of a sudden the building started to move and I heard a boom and everybody got up and took off running. I didn't because I was from Tennessee and I didn't know that the earth shook. And then somebody said, earthquake, move. And then I moved. And do you know what? Nothing was more important than me getting out from under that overhang and standing out in the parking lot until they said it was all clear. Surely God speaks to us like that, right? Shake the earth, God. I'm busy reading the newspaper and eating a burrito. God wasn't in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. Maui burned up. Do you think anybody last year who was on that island, the wildfire didn't have their attention. I mean, you weren't otherwise occupied if a raging wildfire is destroying everything in its path. But God wasn't in the fire. Have you ever noticed that in nature, almost everything that's dangerous is loud? I was thinking about that. That's a random weird thought, isn't it? You ever been in nature, been alone? Usually quiet is okay, unless, you know, something's sneaking up on you. But I mean, like a bear, rawr, they come get you. A rock rolling downhill, a tree falling, you know, you start to hear it. You ever heard a creek or a river as it begins to flood? Everything in nature is loud. Get your attention. All the bad stuff. But Elijah, after he was like, whoa, earthquake, wind, fire, like that band in the 70s. Back in the cave going, what's next? He hears a whisper, psst, I'm not coming out. What are you gonna do next, lightning? You know, forget it, psst. So he comes out, shakes his head out. After the fire came a gentle whisper. Elijah heard it and said, this must be God. Pulled his cloak out to go investigate. And this is what God said. Now you need to read his own story. This is my paraphrase. You read the Bible yourself and you can see behind the scenes here. I created you for a purpose, Elijah. The world is a better place with you in it. There are things that I want you to do, things that I've asked you to do, and these are things you can't do yourself. But if you learn to trust me and live at my pace and not yours, I will lead you through this life and you will be able to say, I am the me the Lord has made. They are the they the Lord has made. It is the it that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. What does that mean? Rejoice, be glad. Two words, compound words, Hebrew. I, I actually got into Hebrew this last week and studied this because I wanted to know what it meant. I spent a lot of time, took a deep dive, went way down the rabbit hole, and there's some beauty here because joy is, is the point. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Not when I feel like it, not because things are going well, not because things are what I expect, but I will rejoice and be glad in it. 
Now, rejoice literally means to know or acknowledge a set of facts. For the children of Israel, it was three facts that they were thinking of when this psalm was written. One, God had protected them. Number two, that God had delivered them. And number three, that there's heaven that waits. God's protection, God's love, and heaven that waits. So if you have nothing else in your life that you feel like you can say thank you for, any joy in your life that you're missing or that you're still looking for, think about these three things, these three facts. They're as true for you as they are for the Jews who heard this or sung this in the first place. God loves you. He protects you and has created a home for you when this life is over. So accepting the facts is the first part. That's the first part of this rejoice and be glad. Accept the things in your life when you see the things in your life. How do you see the things in your life? You slow down and look for the things in your life because you never see beauty when you're in a hurry. You can't have relationship in a hurry. You can't love while you're in a hurry. So we slow down and we see and we acknowledge and we say thank you. And then this be glad. This is the word that I really want us to, to end on. I will rejoice and be glad. Be glad means to respond internally to the external reality. As simple as a sunrise or a sunset, a little baby laughing for the first time or taking her first step. As significant as God delivering you from an illness, providing a job, a friend, seeing beauty where you haven't seen it before, responding to it, saying thank you to God, it's internal. This is what I've done in my own life. This is where you have to apply it to your life. Because I like to keep a to-do list with the Lord and I don't really spend a lot of time looking at blessings and celebrating. It's the way I'm wired. So I bought a spiral notebook and it's not an eight and a half by 11 because if I did that, I would feel like I needed to fill the whole page and that's not the way this exercise is supposed to go. I bought one of those smaller ones, like a half size, spiral. Why not digital? Because my phone keeps going off and when it goes off, I have digital ADD and I go ding, ding and I, and I, I, can't, I can't not chase it. I can't, I can't not pick it up and look at it. So the phone has to be silent and it has to be upside down. And you know what? The world will survive for 10 minutes without me looking at my phone. And it'll survive 10 minutes without you looking at yours too. So I went old school with a pen and paper and I have three columns on my page. Do it if you want, don't do it if you don't want to. This is something I needed in my life. Settled my heart and slowed down for a few minutes and said, okay, God, thank you. First column is thank you. Now, when your thank yous are all about you, it's a start, but that's not where we wanna end up. A lot of true joy and celebration comes in what you see God doing in other people. That's when you know God didn't put them in your life, he put you in theirs. But my first column is thank you. Now my second column is a little cynical. You may not like this, it's all right, I'm trying to be transparent, it's the way I am. First column is thank you, God. The second column is, I think I thank you, God. And the third column is, you know, a request column. And the think I thank you are those things that you think God's doing, but you don't know for sure, but time will tell, right? You ever been wrong? I think this is a blessing from God. And then you end up finding out it was just me trying to create God's will in my life. And it was really a blessing for me that turned out not to be a blessing. So it's an, I thank you, God, or I thank you, God, as best I can guess, as best I can tell. Time will tell. And this is kind of cool because the last few weeks I've been doing this, I've been able to move some things from the, I think it's God to the, it was God column and take some of the, I think it's God and say, nope, that was the Rick column. And I can see, but I'm just as happy that those things didn't happen as I am that those things did. And it's helping to create joy and celebration. Internally, I'm responding to the truths. The third column is the God, please. Please do these things. All of us should have that running list. You can have the list however you want it. You can figure out how to slow down however you have to slow down. You can figure out how to take some time and just be quiet and be still. You can drive with the radio off. You can go for a walk without headphones. You can force yourself to get alone, to slow down, to lower the RPMs in your life. Only you know how to do that, but you have to do it. 
And as you slow down, as you create margin, as you begin to see the beauty in your life, as you begin to respond to God, as you see him in unexpected places, as you find Jesus in places you never thought you'd find him before. And it causes joy. Then this word doesn't just involve internal emotion and action. It involves external celebration. You have to share your joy. Now I went to Walmart. I didn't even know if they still had this, but I bought and I went by myself. Well, joy was there, but I shopped for myself by myself. And um, I don't even like going into Walmart. I bought joy dish soap. Have you ever seen, they'd still make joy dish soap. Can I have my lovely and talented volunteers to come to the stage now? Joy dish soap. And I made sure that nobody stole my joy. I was so happy that I found joy, uh, not her, but this, that I took a picture of it, sent it to the staff and said, I found joy at Walmart. And they're like, nobody else has ever found joy at Walmart, right? You spend money, but you don't normally find joy. Would you go over here to this side? Thank you. And, um, and so what I want to do is I want to respond. I want to follow the biblical pattern. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice, accept the facts and be glad in it. Be glad is to respond internally and externally. So as I share my joy with you, i put a little bit in there. Okay, I'm gonna put a little bit in there. What I would like for you to do is I'd like for you to start sharing that with my friends. Can you do that? Can you blow some joy on them to share it? Because that's what we're supposed to do, to share our joy because joy is contagious and it's what Christians sometimes, well, we're not known for. There you go. That'll work. I have some friends who are going to help too. Our worship team is going to come out here. And I want us to finish this time together by repeating this great song. Repeat with me. You should know it by now. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. One more time. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, thank you so much for the time that we've spent today unpacking this simple but profound psalm. And I pray, Father, that as we look at our own lives, I know in this room, those watching online at our other service, that there are many like myself who've been convicted. We make excuses about our time more than anything else. If we're not careful, we squeeze you out of every minute of our lives. We are tired, our kids are tired. We're teaching them not to have any margin in their life and not to see joy. We're overscheduling, we're running too fast, trying to accomplish too much, to experience everything. And in reality, we experience nothing. Father, we're exchanging depth for breadth and we're missing out on some of the most important moments you've created for us. I pray that we would be people who will slow down, that we'll celebrate that we will tell you thank you, that we'll live with gratitude, influencing and affecting the world around us. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his love, for his protection, and that he, that you have provided a place for us to go when we finish this life and leave it behind. Because of these things and so many more, we tell you thank you and that we love you. In Jesus' name. Amen.